All right, hello everyone. Today is a short one. We only do one hour because some of us are busy in the second hour. Um, we have a few ones here. Let's start with this one here with Jason. Eric, do you want to take about talk about this? Yeah, sure. Uh, so this is really uh, a bug fix dressed up as an API proposal. So a couple of years ago, uh, we shipped the system.binary data class uh, as part of the system.memory.data NuGet package. Um, that class has been designed with JSON serialization in mind. It defines its own custom converter, uh, which works fine when you try to use the reflection-based serializer. However, because the custom converter is internal, uh, that currently fails in source chain. So this is a proposal to basically just make the custom converter class public so that the source generator can see it and use it. Um, yeah, that's it. Uh, we had a discussion over email about the namespace where the now public converter class should be. Uh, the consensus seems to be that we should move it into the system text JSON serialization namespace as well. So that's it, more or less. <clears throat> that's the same namespace that all the other converters are in, right? Correct. Yeah, that seems fine. And we I, don't expose one, one any other new suggestion. Methods. It's just oh, sorry. it's just everything is just basically from the base class. We just have some overrides or something on it. Correct. It's just overrides. Okay. Um, when it was initially in the system namespace, I'd also suggested potentially including JSON in the name of the type. But now that it's in the system text JSON serialization namespace, that's less relevant. I know most of our converters are internal. The ones that are public, do they include JSON in the name, or are they all just target type followed by converter? The ones that are public do include the JSON prefix. Actually, most of the types in system text JSON contain the JSON prefix in their names. OK, so maybe this would be binary data JSON converter, or we're happy with it just binary data converter. I, I I think binary data JSON converter is fine. Um, yeah, if, yeah, if it's going in that namespace, we should just follow the convention that the types there already have. I mean, the types there all start with JSON, and I don't think we want JSON binary data converter, but they're doing things like, you know, JSON number handling. So, but I think including JSON in it is fine. I mean, what else do we expose? The only one I see is JSON string enum converter. Uh, we now also have JSON number enum converter. So these are the three classes. So non-generic string enum, generic string enum, and generic number enum. Gotcha. But JSON string enum converter and JSON number enum converter are both about a JSON number and a JSON string, not string. So. Yeah. Well, I see byte array converter, memory byte converter. Those don't have JSON in the name. They're in the serialization dot converters names. Oh, they're internal. They're, they're internal. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, I think binary data JSON converter um, avoids conflicting with any other serializ name, serialization namespace someone may come up with with a converter. And uh, yeah, mm -hmm. seems legit. Yeah. Um, so this, what is the suggestion again? Binary data JSON converter. So yep. okay, I see. in in fix it. Source.net shows me internal types as well, not just public types. Hey, hey. Yeah, I got burned with that with a, what was it, IP address? Yeah. The internal one's a struct and the public one's a class. Yeah. <clears throat> so then I guess we're all okay with as proposed. All right, then that was easy. Then let's do the second one. 
Shai, are you here? Yep, I'm here. Perfect. Should I do a brief uh, overview? Uh, that would be good, I think, because I don't think I've read anything yet. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. It's lots of text. It's actually quite simple. So this is to address an oversight. Um, in .NET 6, we introduced the DB batch um, abstraction into ADO.NET, into system data. That's about, um, so when you do a command, you do a one round trip to the database, and a batch is about having multiple mm. statements in a single round trip. Um, that It was a big API. We reviewed it anyway. Um, the two main types that were introduced were db batch and db batch command, where db batch command is the thing that goes in the batch. There was a small oversight there. Um, so on db command, you have a factory method called create parameter. In general system data, because it's an abstraction, you've got factory methods uh, for creating the connection, the command, and parameters that go into the command. Um, command has a create parameter. And for example, dapper, the micro uh, ORM that's pretty standard in .NET, it can take a connection and produce a command from it via these factory methods and then produce parameters to populate the command with. But we, we don't have the, uh, it, Dapper basically can't do the same thing with the batch root. So it can create a batch, it can create a batch command, but there's no create parameter in that path so they can create parameter instances. So what this proposal does is just retrofits a create parameter um, factory method onto db batch command. It also adds a capability method uh, or property, which is a standard thing. And again, in ADO.net, we already have these in various in DB provider factories specifically that tells the consumer, is this DB batch command implementation capable of creating uh, parameters? This is because we can't introduce an abstract um, method without breaking everything. So at least something can look in runtime and find out whether calling that method is going to throw or not. So the default implementation is obviously not supported. There's no backwards compatible implementation that we could put into here, which would, would actually do it, uh, unfortunately. So, you know, barring introducing an abstract uh, method here, that's the best we can do. Um, that's the overview. And the it's unfortunate. <laughs> doesn't need a name. It gets assigned late. Sorry? Um, the create parameter doesn't need the name of the parameter to create. It can be bound after the object's returned. Exactly. That's how, that's aligned with how the DB command create parameter already uh, works. So it, it returns a DB parameter, which is completely mutable with, with a name and everything. Also, not all parameter, not all um, database providers have a name for parameters. Some are positional, so there's no name. It's null, like Postgres. And instead of a non-null returning virtual with a virtual property saying whether or not it would return or throw, would it make sense just to make it a nullable return and null is, I don't support creating parameters? Uh, so we already have this this pattern uh, with the two methods uh, or method plus property rather. If you look in at DB, um, if you look at DB provider factory, for example, you can see the same kind of thing. We've got can create batch, can create command builder, can create data adapter. Um, it's also unfortunate yeah. because you have to first try it, right? You can't fail early, right? So I think I think that maybe the point is, so if you know you're, you're already working with a certain, how can I say this? Like you may be able to do a check early once you you already know which database provider you're you're doing and then throw early and then later you can use this API without having to, you know, bang it or or check for nulls or whatever. There right. could be a okay. scenario like this. Yeah, it's, it's fair. And the the can pattern is is fairly standard. It's just since it didn't take any additional data to validate or anything, it was. Just uh, can we eliminate the burden of needing parallel virtuals? But yeah, yeah, I, I I understand. I I think it also just aligns with with existing practices and and the area and the system data basically. Yeah, I I agree. <clears throat> uh, also, like if you, it it means that if you actually need to support it within your caller, like if you actually need to be able to create a parameter, don't bother calling can just let the exception bubble up and it makes mm -hmm. your code easier. Yeah. Indeed. So the existing parameters collection on db batch command, how do you use it today? So uh, a parameter, a db parameter collection is just basically a collection. It doesn't 
got to support creating parameters. It just you can add them inside, insert them, remove them. It's basically just a list um, or a combination between a list and a dictionary. So you have to use some external means to create um, a parameter instance, which you can then inject into that list. And so presumably people so, did it today because they knew the underlying provider and they were able to go there to create the commands, right? Uh, the, to, to create the parameters, okay. right? Right, so th there are several paths. So if I'm not creating something, uh, if I'm not in an agnostic thing which has to work against multiple providers, I just reference npg SQL batch or SQL batch directly, and then I can new up a SQL parameter, and I don't need any factory method. That's that's one thing. Gotcha. Even if I'm using, if even if I'm using um, the abstraction only, um, you know, only the uh, DB uh, classes. I might still have a DB provider factory. That was the original reason why this was missed. I still might have a DB provider factory, which already has a create parameter method on it. That's like one point where we already have all these factory methods. The problem is that for consumers such as Dapper, they don't have a DB provider factory, the the, the origin point. They just get uh, basically a connection. Dapper is a set of extension methods over a DB connection, So and there's no way to get the provider factory back from a connection, gotcha. which is why we need these things on the on the you know on the types that are more concrete basically or more more down whatever downstream so and this is to address a very we don't want to do you mean like uh, creating a back reference to the provider uh, factory or yeah. something because i mean i mean it, it makes sense convenient wise to have those but it seems like as a generic escape hatch to be able to go back to the provider seems generally useful so, right I think from a connection, it makes a lot of sense, and we we could and maybe should introduce that um, that thing. There also could be cases where somebody doesn't get a connection, but just a batch command, and the batch command doesn't again doesn't back. So yeah. ADO.net, you don't have these back references all the way back from wherever you start. And right. I'm not sure. I mean, uh, imposing that would also make things more complicated because then you have to manage. Uh, you can take parameter and now attach it to something else. Uh, so now the provider has to manage those back references and change them. So that would also complicate things. But I do think that uh, the connection actually does make sense um, right. to have a back reference. And yes, so to, today, presumably, when you add the wrong parameters, is the thing just explodes, right? That's the provider uh, responsibility, exactly. So the, the DB parameter collection abstraction accepts any DB parameter, of course. It's just an abstraction. But then the implementation is supposed to make, to do checks and throw in case you give it the wrong parameter. And that's what they do. Makes sense. It's not the greatest API overall. I don't know. I mean, it seems pretty reasonable considering how the thing was designed. Yep. Um, any other questions? Seems the answer is no. <clears throat> All right, then this was easy. Okay. Thanks for the short notice of handling course. and everything. Anytime. Uh, Steve. If you're still with us. You might be muted. Okay. Can you hear me? Yep. Yeah. So based, basically, based upon cloud native feedback, um, they would like these two extension methods, which they already have um, in their older legacy code. And they either need us to add them or they need to add them to the Microsoft extensions repo. And after looking at them, I, I think they make sense to put in the um, in, in our repo in the runtime repo. Um, like most extension methods in this area, they're they're simple wrappers on top of um, existing methods and don't really add any functionality, but they um, are very convenient. Sorry, I have to parse this syntax for a moment because we apply attributes to generic parameters, which I'm not that used to um yeah maybe the api usage down below will make it a little more obvious um and before and after
So is it really just a shortcut for chaining validate on start to the end? Yeah, I mean that, that that's the main okay. thing, except for the uh, the one the second example um, simplifies it as well by specifying the um, the um, option the, the the validator that you can pass in. Mm. Yeah. It seems a bit weird to me to put the validate on start before options because the existing method is add options, right? So I would say add options and validate on startup or something so that they show up next to each other rather than fairly disjointed. Yeah, I think um, the interface, um, well, the existing method is called validate on start. So that's kind of where that came from, but. I'm not sure. I, I, I think the, uh, the, the if you scroll, it shows what the original name was used by um, Cloud Native was. I, I forgot what that was at the moment. This one here, you mean? Um, if Yeah, way to the top, it says, note that in Cloud Native, these methods were called add validated options. Here they, they are called ah. add validate on start options. So yeah, I'm definitely open for naming here. You mean this was the existing name in R9, right? Yes. Yeah. And that doesn't imply to me that it's validated when you turn start and versus on first use. Oh, I see. Yeah, I'm, I'm less on that. I, it's just to me, I would just have it as a suffix to add options. Right, because I mean, this is the existing starting point, right? Add options. So we just have something like add options and and then whatever you want to say afterwards on starter or something. Something like that, yeah. Just so that they show up in IntelliSense next to each other so people get the impression that, yep, this other one doesn't validate and this one does. Other than that, it makes sense to me. And I would agree that we should just build it, have it built in on the core one. Right. So let me think about this for a second. So it almost seems like I would just combine the two, right? Add options is the is the existing one. The other one is validate on start. They would just say add options and validate on start because it kind of is the shortcut for chaining them, right? It's almost tempting just to call it validate on start and say the add options is implicit. You know, if they're already there, it's not adding anything anyway. Um, well, that's the existing one, right? Validate on start without anything. Um, but that's on options builder. But yeah, it is. I would worry a little bit that they would come back and be like, but it's an iService collection method that's not add, um, which kind of fair. Yeah, like would, would validate, would the verb validate imply that you're mutating the collection? I mean, technically, <laughs> if you call like dot configure to configure options, you, you're mutating the collection by adding an I configure options or whatever. Um, so, you know, it's just like there's a higher bar when you add like kind of a new initial word, right? Because add is so common um, yeah. when you use things when you add services to service collections. But add and on validate blah, 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 does sound bad. So I kind of like just validate on start. <laughs> So I'm somewhat confused now what the suggestion is, but my impression is validate on start already exists, right? But you call it after you already called add options, right? Isn't the proposal basically to just say you have one method that does both add options and calls validate on start? I thought that's what it just does. I think now you have to call new options builder, T options, whatever. If you look at like the, the code, it actually shows the implementation if you scroll up. Um, it's like one or two lines, but yeah. 
Yeah, I was just looking at these two things here, right? Where you basically you say add options and then you say validate on start and now you just say add validate on start and then you never have to say that. That's why I was saying add options and validate on start because you basically just combine them into one call. That was my impression based on what Steve said. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I think it's a fine name. It's just wordy, but it is more clear. And if you didn't have options in the name, I'm sure it would be a little bit confusing, though the options type is generally the generic parameter, which usually has options in the name. But um, I I'm okay with it. I was just trying to think of ways to shorten it. That's all. But maybe, you know, there's such a thing as being too short. <laughs> yeah. It... Yeah, add options and validate on start is fine. There would also be the generic parameter. It'd be quite the long line of code, but <laughs> yeah. Do we typically use and? I mean, do can we say something like um, with instead? I mean, either one. I works. think I prefer with. We definitely have methods that say and, like get hash and reset. If it's two verbs, it should be and. I mean, it's usually followed I'm fine by a noun. either way. I mean, and sounds a bit more grammatically correct than with validate on start. Because I think when you say with, you want to say with validation on start. But I, again, don't care yeah. too much. Because really, you're not validating on start at that moment. You're just enabling that feature. Um, so I think with makes a little more sense. But I'm all for consistency elsewhere. So you're basically saying it's not, you say with validate on start is just with the feature called validate on start. I guess well, I mean, validate on start w when you call it doesn't actually do anything, right? It um, it just registers it to validate on start later. Yeah, I kind of like it because the validate on start is an identity builder extension method. So if you're going to like the language analysis, it's almost like the prepositional phrase or something. Um, so, so like I can kind of see with there, like. Oh, of course, no, I changed only partially the text. So we cool with this then? I'm okay with it. Seems good. Alrighty. Let's see. Sweet, done. Thank you. And what we did, what did you say with this one last time? Um, we just lost quorum last time, right? I think that was the uh, the summary. So yeah, well, not not just that, but also that we there was a small disagreement on um, on how this should actually behave. Do you want to recap this, Lever? Of, uh, I guess. <laughs> Um, so if you're, uh, th there are two interesting behaviors, um, of spam that could get people into trouble. Um, the first is, uh, the distinction between null and empty spans is a little nebulous. Um, because when you do an equality comparison, like the equals equals operator against the span, uh, it's comparing both the internal pointer and the length, um, so what happens is you could have a span that is marked is empty and it could literally point to nothing like it could be a null pointer um, or it could have a reference to a non-null memory address but a zero length 
Um, and, and these both represent empty uh, as far as span is concerned. Um, and what we're seeing in practice is that, um, is that people are sometimes doing equals equals comparisons to do basically the equivalent of deep equality. Uh, they're, they're using equals equals sometimes to do a comparison against empty, or they're doing equals equals to be a comparison against a constant literal string. Um, because the span equals equals method does not behave equivalently to the string equals equals method. Um, and they, they are kind of two distinct issues, but there was an open question as to whether, because it is ultimately the equals equals operator on span and read only span, uh, as to whether we should just try tackling both of them with a single analyzer rule. Right. And I think one of the things that Jeremy had brought up is um, like equals equals null might be confusing if you write it because like, are you sure you meant to write that? But equals equals default might make more obvious at the call site that you really did intend for this to be all zero initialized. Um, because what, what happens with null is that uh, the null, null gets implicitly turned into an array, which implicitly gets turned into a default span. So it's the equivalent of equals equals default even though it's going through a few layers of indirection. Right. Yeah, which, and <clears throat> go ahead, Emo. Yeah, which is pretty sure that the person did not intend to do that. Right. Yeah, like I think that in an analyzer that's warning against a comparison against the literal null is fine. And if we're concerned about span equal equal string not being what people expect because they've changed string to read only span of char, I think that's a fine different analyzer, but I think that there was a suggestion last time this came up that maybe we should just block all of the Boolean operators off of span. And I think if you're coming from array, what you expect is the reference equality and the span equality is built on array equality, which is, I mean, span is pointer in length as opposed to the same array, but it's basically the same thing. So I think there's maybe two issues, but I don't think that the valid conclusion is worn if you're using operator equal equal. So you're okay with anything that involves the non literal? I think if you've written span equal equal the null literal, while it will do a thing that may be the thing that you want it to do, it's only because of an accident. Uh, it should have been a compiler warning, but the compiler found a way to avoid the warning by doing an implicit object conversion in the middle. And so putting up that warning just to be equivalent with the compiler saying, hey, you compared a struct to null, that's probably not what you meant, is totally fine with me. But is it then fair to say we should warn for any comparisons against spans and memories involving the null literal, like double equals null, not equals null, is null, is not null? Is that still, is that at least fair to say? Yeah, for the for the null literal. Yeah. Um, yeah, that seems that seems because fine. it's like if, putting span back on track with or back as equivalent with every other struct. Yeah, we've like, discussed a few times in the past whether or not we should actually have a span dot is null, mm -hmm. and we've always said maybe if we get enough feedback. We're not quite sure if it's actually necessary, yada, yada. Should we just go ahead and bite the bullet and say there's enough users that need and use span that need to know the difference between default and null that we should just have is null? I think the people writing equals equals null for the most part actually intended to write is empty. Or they were converting from an array-based code and they're asking if they've initialized their value yet and it's completely not what they want. Yeah. Right, and that's why I was saying, asking if we should have is null, that way there's the explicit disambiguator. Users don't have to consider, am I using operator equality correctly? You have is default, you, which, which you have is null, and you have uh, is empty, um, which are the three things that you need to consider. And most of the time, you only need is is default or is empty. 
we've we've made great pains to have to, to to get users to avoid having to think of null spans like we we've taken substantial steps to just get people to realize like an empty is zero length that's all you really need to worry about um if we introduce is null into the equation like i'm sure we'll make power users happy but i think we'll confuse the 95 percent of our dev audience because now they'll right, be like it, wait what is this doing right but i think the issue is that as much as we've tried to avoid it span leaks it there there's that's what operator equality is doing it is leaking the fact that there is a difference between null and not null yeah i mean i don't know that this itself justifies adding an is null or is default or whatever property on span since it was just like hey at least my interpretation of the issue was if I have some other struct and I compare it to null, the compiler gives me a warning. And if I have a span and compare it to null, it does something. Um, and I, I think that patching that problem with a warning specifically for span against the null literal is fine. But I don't know that we have evidence that says we need to do anything about the me being like one of three people in the world who care the difference between the empty string span and the null string span. But that's also not specific to spam. The same is true for mutable ray. Same is true for strings, really. Same is true for rays as well. It's just the same thing, right? It's the difference between null and empty. And interrupt code notably cares a lot, a lot uh, can care about it. Mm -hmm. um, because some APIs need to differentiate. Um, it, it, it's just a, it, it's the kind of thing that ends up like it, it leaks through in so many places that as much as like if we really wanted to have abstracted it, we should have properly abstracted it. And users who wanted to check if null should have had to go through like an unsafe API like memory marshal dot get reference to get the underlying reference, and then use unsafe is null ref. But we yeah. didn't do that, and so we're, we're we're stuck with this world where we we've we we leak the details in one of the APIs that most people are going to try and migrate toward using. I would be totally fine with memory marshal dot is null. Um, I'm what I'm really afraid of doing though is putting is null in front of the majority of our dev audience, who I think would be very confused by it. Yeah, but anybody who's smart enough to call memory marshal is null probably knows they can just do equal equal default. And again, I'm, you know, me saying we shouldn't mark equal equal as obsolete is because sometimes you just want to know are these two spans literally the same span, right? Like, not even checking mm -hmm. against null slash default. So equal equal e is equals fine. equals default. Like equal equal default actually does a different check than is null. Uh, right. Well, because is null, I think will always be false. No. What what I meant is like is null literally would only look at the pointer. It wouldn't look at the length. Equals equals default would look at both because it's oh, literally sorry. comparing the tuple. There's a lot of like programs, right, where it wouldn't make a difference though because you're the one who assigned it last with default or something. Like yes. it does seem over prescriptive. Um, in, I don't know. Yeah. I mean, to some extent, I'm, I don't even think that null versus empty is an implementation detail. I think that's just the shape of the type, like in, in principle. I think that's, I really don't think that that's a, you know, a complicated implementation issue that we are leaking here. So having users what, being what, able to deal with that, I think seems reasonable. I, what I, what I, one thing that I'm afraid of people doing is that they're going to feel like they have to change all of their existing code to say if span dot is null or span dot is empty, go down this other code path. So they're going to unnecessarily complicate their code that was already working today because they were just checking as empty and that's it. 
Well, but they might not have, right? It depends on what they've written, right? If they said double equals null, then that's not what they're actually doing. <laughs> which is why this anal which is why this analyzer is good and would tell them like, depending on your scenario, you probably meant is empty. I think the majority of people actually want is empty in this case. I don't know. Like, I mean, I've, 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 I didn't use span a lot, but I did use immutable array a lot, and it really depends. Like, usually the is default is what I use for initialization. Because once it's initialized, empty is a fine state, so I don't actually care that it's empty. I just care, did I initialize it yet? <laughs> so I have to use right. is default all the time. Right, and like my, yeah, my off-the-cuff assumption is if somebody's upgraded array code, to span and they have an equal equal default, what they meant is have I assigned right. the the buffer yet? Which and I guess for a span it I happens could... that empty will will be the like, yeah, unless your buffer unless you wanted to allocate an empty buffer, in which case this yeah. check will tell you yes when the answer was no or the other way around. But so for you know, for your case for instance, I would assume that init properties would actually be a better way to say like I require this to be initialized rather than doing an equals equals default check. No, because most of the time it's computed. It's usually lazy initialization because of immutability. I have to do it lazily in order to solve the problem that it's a graph. Because okay. I can't actually initialize it all the way down. Like you can't talk about a thing after a loop. Yeah. Unless it's been initialized before the loop. And what you're asking is, did the loop actually overwrite it? You can make a new Boolean or you can ask, is it? something other than the null I gave yeah. it to begin with. In fact, half the time now I just use um, immutable interlocked to, to actually do it. But it's more or less the same pattern. I think the problem is like for spans, it's probably less likely because spans are very unlikely to be fields most of the time. So they're usually in, inside of a method, in which case it doesn't really matter how you do it. So I, that's what I'm saying to me, at least it depends. But I would say like the original statement that we made, I think still holds, right? When people compare with an knowledge rule, they get some behavior, but it's not clear to me that they actually meant what they wrote. <laughs> so right. they should decide whether, did they mean the default or did they ask, did they mean to ask whether you're empty, right? And then do one of the two things. Yep. <laughs> so how do you check whether something is empty? You just call is empty, right? Yeah. It's optimized. It's good. So then are we then okay with the proposal here to say we warrant for it and we basically tell people like, you know, do one of these things. Which basically, you know, opens the question, which category is this in? And I guess, which, what is the severity that we assign the default? Well, so if you're comparing against null, that third bullet doesn't really make sense. That third bullet really only makes sense if you're comparing yeah. against a non-null literal. I would agree. Um, I mean, the severity should be warning because what we're doing is just putting back the warning that you're comparing a struct against null. I would agree with that as well. Yeah. I mean, the only downside is it might be noisy, but... Category would be maintainability? Is that a category? Yeah, what's, what's the one we use for the null struct comparison? I think that's performance. What? Wait, no. Yeah. Well, the, the built-in one would just be the compiler. It's, compiler. it's not a category. Warning. Yeah. Oh, it's a compiler warning. Yeah. 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 Reliability then? Is what are the categories? Are the categories. Apparently the word category is difficult. So the three that probably make the most sense to me would be maintainability, reliability, or usage. Though usage might be a bit of a stretch. 
Everything's usage, though. When is usage ever wrong? <laughs> <laughs> when when my usage is better than yours. <laughs> Where do you see them here, the cutting noise? Oh, I just found some random blog post. I think there's design, usage, reliability, and performance, at least, right? All right. I reliability the, I is... The link in chat. Yeah, reliability... Because I remember we looked this up previously. I don't know why I can't find it easily in my search history. Reliability is if you don't do this, your app's going to crash. Or if you do this, your app is going to crash. Yeah. So it's not reliability. So use, usage is described as supports proper usage of .NET, which is sure. I mean, yeah, by that definition, almost anything is that, yeah. I mean, it is. Everything's always usage. It's just you can come up with something better. Yeah. I mean, it works, right? Yeah. Yeah, that table. I mean, honestly, I don't care, quite frankly. Like, to me, category is almost irrelevant. It's like, what really matters is the, is the severity. <laughs> so usage has code clarity rules in it already, which probably better matches this. Yeah, and while maintainability sounds reasonable it's mostly about it's like the excessive class coupling warning and then the hey you should use name of because that way if you rename this thing it'll get updated with it yeah some things that i see in usage are uh you have a weird you have an incorrect comparison against nan um you have you're calling string compare when you should be calling string equals uh Things like that feel like they're in the same general class as this. Yep. It's like <clears throat> what you're doing works, but it's not really canonical .NET, so change it. Yep. Right. All right, so then this is done. So should we look at anything or should we call it an early day? Like we're done with all the 801s, now it's all future stuff. We have Eric, we could do the use zero byte read one. Eric, you got called out. If I can remember what that is. <laughs> or we don't have to, I just, it's at the top of the list and you're here, so. <laughs> yeah, so so for reference, um, the, the reason that we didn't consider this last time is because there was a thought that it might affect um, source generation, and we wanted a rep from the uh, JSON team here to talk about it. Uh, I don't, unfortunately, have enough context to be able to weigh in on that, so I would recommend okay. just skipping it for now. Okay. And what about the first one on the list, Eric? Oh, actually, also... Michal actually just joined, and he's the one who opened the bug. So, so we do we want to use zero byte reads? Uh, I, well, all, all I saw was that Miha just topped in the chat. So, uh, Do we have the JSON people, people to comment on the questions from last time? Yes. Uh, but like I said, I, I don't recall any discussions that were done here. So I'm, I'm not sure how useful I'll be able to be today. Uh, might be able to catch up ad hoc if you want but so maybe we should just give it more than 10 minutes okay <laughs> sorry Miha. no worries i think this one we basically skipped for eternity right because of the wpf impact right That's the question right now is, do we think it's a 10 minute issue? I mean, it should be, but it's not. <laughs> <laughs> well, if it's not, then. No, I mean, it, it is fundamentally simple, right? The, the question is, so are we going to fix the UI stacks to, to actually implement those correctly or not? And that to me is kind of the, so, I mean, the API itself is completely reasonable. There's nothing wrong with the API. The, the, the event pattern based on the way the events are designed are already handling batches. It's just that they never get raised because you can't really create batches to begin with. 
So we add APIs to do the batches. So now we can raise events that involve batches. But the problem is now that the UI stacks don't handle it. So apparently WPF literally throws an exception when uh, in a batch-like event is being raised. And so the question is now, okay, if we add this API, then we are effectively putting ourselves on the hook to make at least the UI stacks that we ship with .NET work with that eventing pattern, right? And I think the question is, are we, do we care enough to do that? Or do we, do we say we don't care enough to add these APIs, right? That's kind of where the conversation lies. And so far, if the, I, yeah. Yeah, if I recall correctly, the, the last time we had a discussion about this, uh, somebody proposed introducing a feature switch that defaults to uses batching and for anyone needing to use the frameworks in a way that, you know, this change breaks them. and. For them to be able to broken to be broken, somebody needs to call these new uh, uh, these new methods. Anyways, they would just turn off the feature switch and you know happy days. Yeah, personally, I don't I don't buy that. <laughs> I, I I think honestly this is too complicated. I, I would I would say we either don't do the API, or we are basically saying okay we do the API but then we make it work. It seems very weird to me to sip an API and then do extra work on top to work around issues that we ship with that API pattern. That seems backwards to me. I mean, I think it would be reasonable to do this as a long tail mechanism to say, hey, WPF is fixed, but you know, there's a bunch of third party UI stacks that we don't control, like let's say Avalonia. And so for those, we might add the switch. But I think the elephant in the room is, are we going to fix WPF? And the answer so far was no. <laughs> so that to me is kind of the the, the elephant in the room there. But presumably if we do ship these eventually, that might bring the incentive uh, for that, for, you know, uh, <clears throat> subscribers uh, to fix that eventually. I would agree with that. I just don't think we can do this to the stuff that we ship in box. Like I mean, we should, if it we goes should... in early at a release, then... I mean, yes, Either we could do this. Someone from the runtime or... team or community member can say hey there's a thing wpf you should do it i or, think that not only should you do it here's the code to do it we've done it just just merge so, yeah I, I mean from wpf's perspective at the moment like there's nothing actionable we tell them that there's an issue but they can't see it because you know these events don't exist right i mean we could do it early in nine and then basically yeah. just say you know that there's a there's a tracking bug but I think that's kind of, I mean, to me, it, it, the, the odd thing is we, we ship the whole thing as one, as one stack, right? So it seems backwards to me to ship something that we know breaks part of the thing we're shipping and then just say, well, they just have to fix it. It's like, we, we should be on the same page with our own people to say, like, are we going to absorb that cost or not, right? And so far the answer was no, because it wasn't important enough. Like, I have literally no idea how expensive that fixing WPF is. If it's super expensive, then the answer might be it's not important enough, right? If it's trivial, then sure. But I think that's kind of not my decision to make. It's theirs to make, right? Yeah. I mean, yeah. to me, the right answer is this is the right shape. And we should approve the API. And if the feature has to be pulled because we can't make it work in the in the box for nine, then the feature gets pulled. But the API is, a, I don't see why we would hold the approval on the shape. I think that happened already. I want to. I'm pretty confident we reviewed the API. It, it did. It was an implementation was provided and the PR was reverted. Exactly. So uh, we are at that point already. <laughs> then why is it marked as ready for review instead of approved? Uh, I think we went back to, to, to basically make the decision whether we want to approve the API or not. Let me actually see. Yeah. About more, yeah. I think. So I. I actually marked it ready for review, uh, okay. including the feature switch uh, proposal. Yeah. Do you see this here? 330 items? <laughs> <laughs> that, that is why there was a lot of discussion. And GitHub is annoying me by making me click 12 more times. Um, yep. And every time you push it, it moves the button. 
since I assume every bug is Kevin's bug to fix, Kevin, you should fix that UI issue. If you're even with us today. Do you see this? <laughs> we approved it. And then we and we moved it back to API ready for review to discuss basically whether we should change the shape to uh, effectively add the feature knob. And my stance is still like, I mean, I'm okay with the feature knob if, we, if we're basically saying, okay, there is a long tail of bugs potentially in third party libraries that, you know, this is the workaround. I still don't buy that this is the way to do with WPF. WPF, in my opinion, is we ship it in box. We either fix it at the same time we add these APIs or we don't. But if we don't, then we don't add the API. Like they're, they're, it's, it's one stack. We ship one stack and we either make it work or we don't. But we're not going to ship something that will definitely not work with WPF. That makes no sense to me. And that's, I think, the discussion that we had. And I think so far the problem is that we we think the API is useful, but then do we think it's useful enough to, <laughs> you know, raise it to tactics and say, hey, WPF, you need to fix this. And I think the answer for that so far was also no. And that is why the API is sitting here for right, but, I don't know, six years now. But let's, Seven. you know, the implementation that we approved, right? If the If the base implementation of insert items range is just, you know, a for each insert, then yes, you'll get like 75 events. But that's the same thing that you would get right now if somebody had to write this loop themselves. So as long as the base implementation doesn't do bulking and batching, then who cares? Which it can't because it doesn't understand the storage mechanism. Like, because this is collection of T. No, right? this is like, observable collection, right? The shape that was approved said it was on collection. And observable uh, collection presumably gets it by inheriting collection. Sure, let's go with that. I mean, but I, I think the point is that the base implementation would use batching, right? Well, but it can't. No, because there's the no collection add. of T doesn't have a storage. No, it doesn't have system. No, it doesn't have add range to begin with, right? So today, when you want to add, so add add range exists on list of T. It doesn't exist on collection of T. So today, there is no way for you to do batch operations to begin with. So this would add batch operations. And then implementations right. for those on observable collection would raise batched events. But so the collection of T, oh, collection of T's list. Ah, because the collection of T doesn't have storage. So, uh, but it does because it's a list. Yeah, I, I thought it was a, I thought it was a, ABC, but um, apparently it's not. It's a. No, well, it's a renamed version read, of list. I think you think of read only or observable. I think. Which are just wrappers, but I mean the the, the point stands that basically the, what we have, what, what this feature is we basically add batched events, right? So that, so we add operations that are, that support batching, and then those would immediately raise those events, right? So that means if you call any of those APIs with .NET eight, and WPF doesn't support that, it just blows up. And probably not in all cases because it probably depends on what the actual event is and what the shape is and what the state of the collection is, right? So you might end in a world where some things work and some things don't. And then, you know, the question is, are you going to fix it? And the answer might be yes or no. <laughs> and last time when we did it, we basically decided that it was too late to do anything meaningful to WPF, so the feature got pulled. And I think to me, this is still the same today. Like, I mean, we can decide that we add this feature switch uh, as Eric proposed it here, which I mean is for me, I, I think I'm okay with that. I'm not sure I like this particular shape here, but I think uh, I'm okay with the idea yeah. of having that. But I think the question is, okay, to me that does not fix WPF. Like I, I still assert we can't ship something where WPF is still broken unless you set it to false, right? Yeah. Uh, for what it's worth, I would probably change that to be a Read only property, and it would only be able to set this by a feature switch. Just yeah, that's, for clarity. Yeah, no, I mean that's fine. I think to me this is this is almost irrelevant, right? I, I think the question is okay. Are we going to ship a feature that there's some opt in or opt out mechanism because we know WPF doesn't work with that, right? Do we think that's acceptable? I I would think it's not. So I think the question is still, are we pushing hard enough? To, or like, if we do this feature, I think we need to push on WPF to, to make it work. 
Like it's literally the first, it's the, it's the, it's the primary inbox consumer for this API. So, I, I, and I think the question is, is this feature important enough? And that one I don't have an answer for. <laughs> And that's kind of why, why I think this API is stuck. <laughs> you talked to them last time, Eric, right? Yeah. Uh, so just as a recap, uh, I did get a quote from uh, an engineer in the WPF team stating that it would be very expensive to adapt to that change because they claim that effectively every subscriber to observable collection would be uh, one way or another affected by this. Uh, so uh, any single uh, subscriber that receives an event that has more than one uh, elements in it, you know, that would blow basically. That would throw an exception. Uh, and they, they claimed it would be super expensive to make an adaptation there. Well, the you mean any subscriber like in WPF because I mean yeah. it's not like we have to change the notify collection change to event args like that already no. supports well, this. It, it supports this, but there's no way to uh, you know trigger an event that has more than one element in it, right? And, right. and therefore using an observable uh, collection, sub presumably someone else could have already, right? Th they could have, but the. The official implementation does this, and uh, as, as a side effect, most subscribers in WPF have taken a dependency on that invariant. Yep. And if you're like me and you tried to write your own, you realize it didn't work, so you never shipped it. <laughs> I mean, this is the entire point of this API, is to make UI frameworks faster, right? So. If we don't, then right, but there's like, yeah, I guess it's tough, like, um, because it's not like there's some prep work we have to do with the events, right, to support ranges. It's there, like, um, I guess WPF has the prep work, and if we know their, um, their known issues, I, I do see the problem. But like, the only way we're gonna get rid of all the issues is probably to make this change, right? Yeah, yeah but, I, I, but but I think the problem to me, it's kind of like I think it's not our call to make, right? I mean, the other thing, depending on whether or not somebody thinks collection of T is valuable and should have the change, is that collection implements add with bulking because it just calls, because apparently it wraps any I list you give it. Uh, so it can do it with bulk operation, and we make observable collection overwrite all the virtuals to just for each and call the existing methods. So now observable collections support batching and syntax, but not in function. And collection supports it in function. Like we I mean, can, that seems to be all upside, which I guess is good. It's we, we can let the people who want to use collection as their generic or as their collection type do the bulk operations from list. It's only the, and then the observable ones would just pretend this change didn't exist. Unless somebody then goes and derives observable collection and says, no, really, do the bulk thing, which they would have the choice to do because it's virtual. I mean, they can do that today already, right? They could derive it and go add an add range method, but they can't add a method on the on the type itself so that somebody could have yeah. called it from library code. No, but my point is that you can just implement I notify collection change yourself on your own type. And, you know, I mean, it's, it's more work, sure, but like you, in principle, can make that work with, if you have your own UI framework, right? The whole point here is that you want to use the built-in types with right. the standard UI uh, frameworks and have that work, right? And that, no matter what we do, that's not going to change that. Well, some people just want a more efficient add range on collection and don't compare care about the observability, right? And I guess Jeremy's point is we could do that without changing how observable collection fires its events. I don't think so, honestly, because I think if you look at collection of T or observable collection of T, those are kind of things you use, um, you know, in object models, right, where efficiency isn't in high order bit. Because basically, what you do there is you try to make 
either state sync across multiple, you know, components, or you have things that are kind of bound to UI, right? So if you actually well, care I mean, about efficiency, then you use like list of T directly, right? You're not using collection of T. I was gonna, I, I think that people want to call add range because they don't want to write a for loop. <clears throat> well, <laughs> there's that too. Yeah. I mean, that one is trivial, right? You just do that yourself. But I think the whole point here is that you, you want things to just meaningfully work, right? No, I mean, I completely agree with that. Like, why should I have to write a for loop? Especially like when we can make this work without changing the events. Like yeah. if that's the only thing stopping us is like, oh no, changing the way the events fire is gonna break the world, which I believe like, yeah, Jeremy's idea is like, yeah, but you still don't have to write for loops to add, add things to these collections. I mean, we could do that. I think the problem that I would have with that is that can we ever change that then, right? I mean, let's That's say- we... the same problem we already have, right? Like apparently we can't. <laughs> We can we can't change right. the event. So, I mean I mean honestly like if we just rescope the problem to, you know, people don't have to write loops and stuff continues to work, it's just as slow as today. I I would be okay with that. That seems like a no brainer to approve. It just means if we go down that path, I think we, it's probably harder for us to change that later because somebody will have to take a dependency on that behavior then. Uh so in a sense we are kind of making a decision what we want the outcome to be. Is it just convenience I, or do we make the events better? I can't imagine supporting these add range methods would make it any harder to group up the events later. Like we already can't, you know what I mean? Like people already depend on these things one item at a time. Can they depend any harder on that? Like <laughs> apparently yeah, I mean, the whole ecosystem does like depends on this being an item at a time. So how are we making it worse? Well, today you can't do it, right? So that's the thing, right? So today you can't depend on the fact that there's an add range method and you get, you know, n number of events, right? Today you have to call add yourself. So the fact that you get n events is because you call the the add method n times, right? If we, I mean, if we here's now, if we now add an add yeah. range method that is one call on your side, and today it raises n events, and tomorrow it raises one event, right? That's you know now you break people in a different way, right? All right. So what if we put it on collection? The virtual calls the bulk operations on I list, assuming they exist. Um, and then on observable collection, instead of putting a static should observable collections used range notifications, um, we put an instance property. It defaults to false, and anybody who wants to turn it on can turn it on. So observable collection overrides the the virtual and either does bulk notification if you turned it on and individual notification if you haven't, which it would do by just deferring to add or insert or remove over and over again. That way it's an instance level thing. And if you're doing a thing that's you want the observability, but you're not WPF, you get it. Like, I don't think we should hold back the data types just because a framework or because a UI framework or all the UI frameworks won't do it right. Sometimes you just want observable collection because of data. Do you think it might still make sense to include a feature switch that would override that property on the individual instances, like assuming that you... Like, I would get rid of the static that you have right there okay. on the proposal and... Sorry, you have it on. You have a static on observable collection, non-generic. I would just make it an instance boolean on observable collection of T. It defaults to right, false, right, and if but... one day we feel confident that we can add an app context switch or something to make it default to true, then we do. And until then, we don't. I have to be. But honest, I think I don't see the value in that. I assume there are people who say collection of T because they say, I don't care that it's list. Collection is the base class of list, right? Well, not once they're generic, apparently, but. Uh... If you're if you're subscribing to events uh, on a collection whose uh, code you don't control, uh, would it be valuable for you as a subscriber to disable batched events, even in that case? 
like the, the scenario here being that you're referencing some kind of Ruget package that defines observable collections that default your Boolean property to true for every instance that it creates, but you as a subscriber still want to not receive batched events because somehow downstream this is breaking your subscriber. Yeah, maybe. I don't know. I mean, it is... I wouldn't go out of your way to disallow the what Jeremy's proposing would support that, right? Just the public property. Yeah, because the caller could receive the collection and just <laughs> use <laughs> batch notifications equal false. And ha ha, nobody else who subscribed to this could get them. And then the next person just sets it back to true and uh, <laughs> life goes on. Problem. Yeah, but like maybe it's fine. It's not meant to be concurrent. Um... But yeah, I mean, like if we were only talking about this at observable collection of T, then I could say, sure, we say that the maybe the feature doesn't make any sense. But we're talking about it at collection of T, which is not tied to UI frameworks. It's just object modeling. I think that adding the methods on collection of T makes sense. And if we need to defend observable collection, that's what we should do. But I also think that we're 10 minutes over and Nemo's supposed to be in another meeting. Yeah. So, I think by approving it, we save ourselves time at this point. How old is this issue? <laughs> Seven years. I think we've talked about it a few times. Yeah. Um. I mean, it, it really comes down to like, what's the customer, right? And I mean, yes, in principle, it's not tied to UI frameworks. I think in practice, that's where it's at. I know ASP.NET Core uses it for its data source collection. It's like the one place it does. But allows you to add endpoints so dynamically at runtime for Use collection routes. or observable collection uh, observable collection okay yeah because my my question is we have this type collection of t who uses it and if it's anybody that's not a ui framework then i think we should give them ad range yeah. and for what it's worth the as connect core's usage of observable collection would not break with ranges because it just scans everything anyway um yep so then i guess we are back to we haven't made a decision yet so i feel like fundamentally we should i think at this point make a decision let me let me push this again let's have another chat with the wpf team on this and then decide whether we want to do this for nine or not and then we can decide whether we do it anyways for the for the collections without uh, WPF. Uh, in which case, we would have effectively like two separate features, right? One on the core collection type, and one that is tied on uh, that is basically tied to the eventing. And then we can decide whether we split it or whether we have an opt out mechanism or opt in mechanism for the observable collection. Sounds reasonable. I think my gut feel is too complicated. I probably wouldn't go down that path. I would say we we should make a decision and make it just work. But sounds good. Then um, I guess I see you on Thursday, right? Yep. Bye bye. Bye bye, everyone. <laughs>